Welcome, welcome, welcome to episode 8 of the Heart of Markness podcast. Can you believe we've made it 8 episodes? I can't. I'm sorry it takes forever for me to get these podcasts out, but, you know, that's something that all podcasters say, and at least I'm not Dan Carlin, right? So, let's jump into it. The topic of this episode is Led Zeppelin's final tour, the 1980 tour over Europe. Now, as a little backup, um, starting with the Nebworth concerts of 1979, which are featured on the Zeppelin DVD, which if you don't have, go get it now. Leave work, drive off the road, leave your children, leave your kids. It doesn't matter. Just go do it, do it, do it. Because it's awesome. Uh, starting with that Nebworth show in uh, on August 4th and August 11th of 1979, Zeppelin made their comeback after the uh, unfortunate loss of Robert Plant's son, Carrick, in 1977. And uh, at that point, Robert essentially left Led Zeppelin and was persuaded to come back in 78 by John Bonham. And they recorded In Through the Outdoor and did a couple of warm-up shows in Denmark in 79, which were the topic of my first podcast. And then uh, as warm-ups to the giant Nebworth festivals um, on August 4th and 11th, as aforementioned, with um, a couple hundred thousand people in total. The number is disputed, but um, let's just say it was a shitload of people. Because it was. And Zeppelin was ready to uh, get going and get back on the road and be a creative force. They'd lost a lot of ground to the punk movement and the new wave movement and the new romantics and all that stuff in England. And they were consistently and regularly referred to as dinosaurs in the music press there. In the States, they were still huge, of course, because the punk movement didn't really sweep over the entire nation to the depth that it did in the UK. But uh, Zeppelin had been kind of supplanted by... um, Second tier groups like Hart, Aerosmith, Billy Squire, etc. Doing Zeppelin type songs. And um, if that kind of seems offensive, think about it. Uh, Billy Squire, when he came out, that stuff, I mean, it it was mistaken for Zeppelin more than once. Barracuda from Hart, very Zeppelin-esque. Very, you know, Achilles Last Stand-esque. Not, th- not to dog these guys. Hart's an awesome band. I've seen them. They're great. But they're not Zeppelin. So, uh, you know, Jimmy and Jonesy and Bonzo were itching to get back in the saddle and start making some more money, start, start making some more music and going on the road and, you know, being Led Zeppelin again. Robert was ambivalent, you know, understandably so, because he had the the perspective of, of having lost a child And, um, you know, at that point, uh, Jimmy and Bonzo were deep in their addictions, alcohol, heroin, you know, uh, Valium, all that stuff. And, you know, Zeppelin wasn't the white, hot, screamingly tight but loose creative force that it was in the past. The 77 tour, you know, often would run three, three and a half hours per show, but Oftentimes there were songs that would last 40 minutes, 30 minutes. You could have a 45 minute whole lot of, not a whole lot of love, 45 minute no quarter. Forty, You know, uh, Jimmy's noise solo, Bonzo would have a 20 or 30 minute drum solo. In My Time of Dying was an easy 10, 11 minutes. Trampled Underfoot, an easy 10, 11 minutes. And just all the, you know, Killy's Last Stand, an easy 10, 11 minutes. There were all these songs that went on forever and really became indulgent. And when it worked, it was magic. And when it didn't, it was just fluff. It was over. It was too much. It was too much. And um, there was a backlash to that. The punk movement was a backlash to all these bands like Floyd uh, and Zeppelin and The Who kind of getting lost up their asses in indulgence and, you know, noodling around. So in 79, with Into the Outdoor, Zeppelin addressed those concerns and decided that when they went back on the road, they were going to, the phrase they used was cut the waffle. 
which meant, you know, no more indulgent solos, no more eight million year long songs, no more just suffering through, you know, 40 minutes of Jimmy with his theremin and oscillators and violin bow and stuff. Yes, 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 it's cool. Nobody's saying it's not cool. But by the end of the 70s, it had been done. And, um, you know, <laughs> Lou Reed did metal machine music and you couldn't top that. So so Jimmy ha- no longer had to carry that mantle of avant-garde noise any longer. Um, and that was one of Robert's conditions, too, in, in coming back. Because, as I said, he was ambivalent. You know, he was fine to be done with Led Zeppelin. He was fine to just be at home with his family because, understandably, he was traumatized with losing his son while he was on the other side of the world living the rock star life. So he was he had to be won over, and he actually, I think, for the first time in Zeppelin's history, he may have um, he may have been the, if not the most powerful member, he may have had a lot more weight than he had before. Led Zeppelin was always Jimmy's band, but I think when Robert came back in the late 70s after the death of Carrick, I think Robert had a lot more say in the style and structure of the band because everybody kind of knew that he could walk away and be fine. So, he decided that they would he would prefer to do large large shows like the Nebworth Festival where people could travel to rather than going and out on the road for 6 months and playing all over the country all over the world he would rather play a select handful of dates and have people travel to them to minimize the time he's away from his family and this the time he's on the road. He was over it. He was no longer partying. He wasn't doing drugs, you know, by his own admission any longer and hadn't been for a few years. Whereas the rest of the band, yikes, we, uh, we know, we know. So um, the Zeppelin agreed. I mean, everybody, I think, knew that a change had to happen. And they rolled with it because they're Led Zeppelin and they were still awesome. So they met in May of 1980 at the Victoria Theater in London and rehearsed for their new tour. And they um, word is that they had rehearsed Carousel Umbra, which is on a, in through the outdoor, but they didn't play it live because um, it didn't translate well. The keyboard technology wasn't up to it, although I'm sure it was, but Jonesy is a bass player who plays keyboards, and you know they didn't have a Rick Wakeman in the group who was a keyboard genius as far as getting sounds out of those old analog synthesizers. So, um, you know, if you listen to In the Evening from uh, Nebworth or the 80 Tour, you'll know what I mean with that cheesy synth keyboard sound. It doesn't do anybody any favors, so it's a good choice for them not to play Carousel Umbra live. Anywho, they met in May of 1980 and rehearsed. They booked a European tour to carry off in June of 1980. And they played places they hadn't played since 1973. They had kind of neglected Europe uh, since 1973, not intentionally. Robert Plant had a terrible car accident in 1975, which landed him in a wheelchair for months, which canceled any further 75 tour plans. And of course, the loss of Carrick in 77 scotched any plans for touring after that. Um, Luckily, they had, you know, they had toured the United States, so we have all those shows, and that's great. So they returned to Europe after being gone for seven years. They were playing smaller venues, and smaller in that they were still playing 15,000 seaters. I mean, they're not playing small theaters, but these these were not 50,000 people audiences. And they really did. They cut out a lot of the bullshit. And um, they opened with Train Kept a Rollin' on this tour, which is really, you know, as hearkening back to their early days on their first tour when they were, you know, the New Yardbirds. And they opened with Train Kept a Rollin'. And the tour 
man, I was I was really not too thrilled with this tour for, you know, the last 30 years. I don't know if you know, if you're a if you're a Zeppelin fan of the of of a high caliber, this is all you know, this is all 101 level Zeppelin stuff to you and you already know it, but in the late 80s, the very first Led Zeppelin CD bootlegs that came out were soundboard recordings from the 1980 tour, which had been stolen from Jimmy's house. And um, almost all the, the, the 1980 tour is represented on these soundboard recordings. But because they're so fucking dry, they have no life. They have no ambiance. They have no t- and Jimmy's guitar tone is brittle. It, it, it kind of highlights every mistake he makes. It highlights every... It, it's like looking in a bathroom mirror, like a gas station bathroom mirror with fluorescent lights when it's four in the morning and you've been out partying all night. Yes, that's your reflection, but the environment isn't doing it any favors. And these soundboard recordings do not do the band any favors. So... I was not a fan of this tour because Jimmy is really erratic and Jimmy is really, um, at times, not playing very well and not playing very inspired. And his tone is just brittle and shrill and doesn't have any depth because it's just an input. It, it, there's, no, there's, no, there's no reverb or there's no sound of the room. So there's no life to it. Um, However, the thing that makes made this co- made this tour not shine for me is uh, for the first time in Zeppelin's history, John Bonham wasn't all that impressive. He wasn't bad by any means. There was one show in Nuremberg on the twenty eighth of June where he actually collapsed and they had to stop the show. But he was. Um, you know he he's obviously an alcoholic, and apparently he was he was doing heroin as well, and just you know it <laughs> it was taking its toll. These were still young guys. Bonzo was just you know thirty one, thirty two years old, but um, it was taking its toll. And and listening to his drumming on this tour, it sounds uh, uninspired. Is the only thing I could say. I'm not saying he's phoning it in, but it's just um. I mean, he's John Bonham. I can listen to his drumming on almost anything, and it reels me in because it's so brilliant. And he drives the band forward, and he and Jonesy often carry the band when Jimmy isn't on a good night. It still makes it awesome. And for the first time, it kind of... um, kind of It was kind of just like listening to like Aerosmith. You know, it was good. These shows are good. Most of these song performances are good but they're almost um, rote. They're almost cookie cutter. Um, They don't have much spark. They don't have much spontaneity. And and, um, what I realized recently is that a lot of that has to do with the dryness of the soundboard recording and being shot. It's, you know, it's like, it's like that bathroom uh, mirror metaphor with the fluorescent light and you look terrible, but you change the lighting and you look good. Remember that Seinfeld episode where he dated that girl that was beautiful in some light and hideous in others, but it's the same woman? It's like that with the 1980 tour. And the reason that I say that is because after 30-something years of being a Zeppelin fan, I finally listened to their show uh, from Munich on July 5th, which um, of which there's no soundboard recording, but there is a pretty excellent audience recording. And it, it changed everything. It was fun. It was sparkling. It was alive. And it had to do with capturing the audience and capturing the sound of the room. And Jimmy's guitar sounded like a Les Paul again. And it's fun as fuck. And, and um, I'm going to share that with you. Because this is noteworthy. This is their, their last tour. You know, The last show they ever played was July 7th, 1980 in Berlin. And then a couple months later, Bonzo died. So this is it for Led Zeppelin. And um, what at first I thought was pretty sad and like, oh, thank God they didn't tour the United States, which they were going to do because it would have fucked with their legacy because they would have not been great. Um, I have to change that tune 
in light of this Munich recording and how they sounded in an audience context. And um, I know I'm rambling. I know I always ramble. If you've listened to this podcast before, you know what this is about. But um, I was really inspired by listening to this Munich show to, you know, bring the 1980 tour to the fore. Because if you're listening to this, chances are you're more of a casual Zepp fan or like, a, you know, I love Zeppelin in a, in a I wear their T-shirt kind of way and have all their albums. But you're probably not like me and you probably haven't just delved into the minutia of every second of their life like I have. And even I am, am a, you know, tier two super fan. There are still people who are way above and beyond me that know what piece of equipment the boys played every single night. There's people that know exactly where Jimmy has been every night and what he's done every day for the last 50 years. And, um, you know, I stand on the shoulders of those giants to bring you this podcast and use a lot of their data to bring this information to you. And uh, the person who I lean on the most for this 1980 tour is Dave Lewis, who had a fanzine called Tight But Loose in the 70s and was kind of taken under the wing by Zeppelin and got to hang out at the Swan Song offices and got to see them live and actually got to know these guys because he was such a super fan and had this fan magazine. And he was taken um, on the 1980 tour for a handful of the shows, and he published a book not long ago, which I have, called Feather in the Wind, which is about the 1980 tour, and it's a breakdown of before, after, Every show that he went to, every show that they played, the songs they played, what was good, what may have not been good, and a shitload of photos um, from the gigs. And he's in a lot of these photos, which is adorable. And uh, as well as stuff in, you know, um, after parties. Well, after parties, in hotel lobbies, in the hotel bar, pictures of Jimmy Page and, and things that you don't see every day because, you know, they're personal. So if you're interested in Zeppelin and this podcast manages to hook you on the 1980 tour i highly highly recommend that you go to uh his website it's tight but loose i don't know the url at the moment the one that i used to use was tblweb.com but that's not active anymore he has a uk address and uh use google tight but loose it'll pop right up he is um brought the Feather in the Wind book back to the forefront. It's, he hasn't reissued it, but he's kind of pushing it again. And it's worth getting. It's very inexpensive. It's a lovely hardcover book that is just chock full of data. And um, I got a signed copy when I got mine. Maybe he's still doing that. But in any case, shout out to Dave Lewis. He, he, kept, the, the, he kept the torch going. He's kept the torch going for 40 years now. He's a wonderful guy. He's very generous with his time. He's very generous with his information. And, um, you know, he he's a legitimate, the legitimate voice with a capital V on the history of Led Zeppelin. So hats off to you, Mr. Lewis. One of these days, maybe you'll uh, listen to this podcast. I love you, man. You're great. You've done a lot. You've made me happy for a very long time. <laughs> that sounded weird, but it comes from a good place. Anyway. Oh, actually, I do have his URL. I lied to you. I lied right to your face. I'm sorry, everybody. Anyways, before we go on to the next thing, it's tight but loose, all one word, dot co dot uk. Go there, read it. He has a he has a blog with all the Zeppelin news and information. He has myriad books that he's written. All of them are excellent. Concert reviews. He's great can't say enough about him all righty i've babbled for long enough nobody listens to <laughs> nobody listens to this podcast to hear me talk you all want to hear the zeppelin or the jimmy stuff i don't blame you that's why i do it so before i just start saying ridiculously stupid shit instead of simply stupid shit let's go to the first song i want to play from this tour this is from zurich switzerland June 29th, 1980, and it is Nobody's Fault But Mine. On this tour, it was the second song of the night right after Train Kept a Rollin', 
and they 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 chopped it down. They cut out the two, you know, the minute, minute and a half of no 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 stuff and go right into the song. It's ballsy, it's brutal, it's great. I love it, and I hope you will too. Nobody's fault but mine. Led Zeppelin, The Rock. <laughs> Thank you. 
pretty cool, right? <clears throat> I like that. Now, that was the first CD bootleg I bought in 1989. I paid like 85 bucks for it, which was ridiculous to me. And um, I still have the discs, but to my everlasting shame, I no longer have the case that they came in. I can still see it in my mind. I actually had it in a photo album for years. But um, again, over 30 years, it just became one with the adhesive backing and was just ruined, which sucks because it's worth a zillion dollars now because it's the first fucking CD bootleg that Led Zeppelin ever, uh, well, Led Zeppelin didn't release it. That was ever released by Led Zeppelin on um, Flying Eagle, Screaming Eagle. I don't know. I can see, I can see the disc now, and uh, it makes me sad. Anyway... Now that nobody's fault was my nobody's fault but mine, sorry, was pretty awesome. I liked it. I like it a lot. I like their short truncated version without the without the extra, as they say, cut the waffle. It made it just a kick ass hard rock song, made me happy. But um did you hear what I what I meant about his tone and how the soundboard recording doesn't do them any favors? This particular um version is the best sounding one that I've found. And again, sound is subjective, but I downloaded a bunch of different sources or versions of, of the soundboard source for this show to find the one that was you know the most pleasing to my ears. And this one was, so I hope you enjoyed it. Now that was Zurich, June 29th, 1980. And um, on the very next night in Frankfurt, Germany... They played what uh, is arguably their best show of the tour, and it is super fun. And it, there are people who say that the Achilles' last stand that they played that night is the definitive one for the band. I'm not going to play that for you because, again, it's it's 10, 11 minutes long. I don't want to. Um, you can find it anywhere if you want to, or if not, email me. I'll send it to you, man. I'm a nice guy. So instead, what I'm going to play is something that was unique from that show, which is a jam they did with Phil Carson, who was an Atlantic Records rep um, at that time. I'm not sure. Maybe he was an A&R man. Anyway, he had a history with the band. They liked him. And he played bass. And I think he used to play bass for Dusty Springfield. I don't know why I say that. That just popped up in my mind. So maybe I'm lying. But in any case... He came to see them on this tour and in Frankfurt, Frankfurt, in uh, June 30th, 1980, he came out, Jonesy got on the electric piano, and they played the song Money, you know, the best things in life are free, and you're going to hear that now, because I like sharing interesting and unique Zeppelin stuff with you, and this is interesting and unique. So here it is, June 30th, 1980. Led Zeppelin, joined by Phil Carson, on the old chestnut, Money. Enjoy. This man has one fixation. It's called Money! Oh, 
much. Good night. Ah, I uh, I recorded the end of this podcast and everything afterward, um, but for some reason I think I don't have the mic in a mic stand. I'm just holding it like I'm a game show host, and I must have been moving my fingers or something um, because there were all these noises in addition to my lovely melodious voice that were just ridiculous, like like I was rubbing it, the mic up just up against the wall. It sounded terrible. So I had to re-record this. So here I am, re-recording this. So you just listened to the song Money with Phil Carson from Atlantic Records on uh, June 30th from Frankfurt. And I hope you liked it. I like it. Um, do you see what I mean about the, the uh, Jimmy's guitar tone with these soundboards? It, it's shrill. It's brittle. I, I don't. I don't care for it much. Um, if you don't understand, you'll probably will when I play this next song, which is going to be the last last song in the podcast, and it is the second to the last performance of "Whole Lot of Love" um, before um, the death of Bonzo. It's from July fifth in Munich. It's from an excellent audience recording that really captures the spirit it captures the vibe of the audience it captures the sound of the hall and it's a very fun performance and it's also noteworthy in that they bring on stage simon kirk the drummer from bad company who was also on their swan song label and they set up his drum set next to bonzo's and for the first and only time we have two drummers with led zeppelin playing on two drum kits yes Keith Moon did play with them on June 23rd, 1977 in L.A. However, he did not have his own drum kit. He played the timpanis and all the shit, the the, uh, um, timpanis and the outer shit of Bonzo's rig, but he did not have his own drum set. Simon Kirk does. And it's a fun performance of Whole Lotta Love. I really enjoy it. It, There's humor in it. There's fun. There's playfulness. And um, it's great because, you know, with the two drummers, sometimes they get a little lost and Jimmy has to bring them back. And you can hear him do that, playing the the thing that Bonzo is supposed to play to bring the solo back for a whole lot of love. You hear Jimmy play it with his guitar. It's good. It's fun. And the sound is great. You'll understand, you know, and, and, and you'll get what I mean versus the soundboard. I already said that. Sorry. So now it's time for all the podcast stuff that I'm supposed to do with social media. So, hey, thanks for listening to my podcast. Follow me on Twitter at heartofmarkness.com. Heartofmarkness Fuck. See, I screwed it up already. Heart of Markness on Twitter. Heartofmarkness.com is my site. Visit that because we'll have not only this podcast, but I also have posts of different Led Zeppelin stuff that never makes it onto the podcast. For instance... I have several posts about the 1980 tour with songs that aren't on here, like um, the Zurich performance of Trampled Underfoot, which is my favorite performance of Trampled Underfoot. And, uh, oh, this is neat, too. Also, a performance of the band Santana when they're joined by Jimmy Page um, on the 1st of July in Frankfurt after the show that you just listened to with Money. The next night, Santana was playing the same place. And Santana was actually backstage watching that very performance that you just heard. And uh, they invited Jimmy for the next night, and Jimmy went on, and they play, he jammed with Santana on Shake Your Money Maker and played the fuck out of it. It's great, great, great fun. And it's Jimmy playing at a level that you, you kind of truthfully don't expect him to be playing at anymore at this point in his, in his tour with his addictions and such. But it kicks ass. So go listen to that. It'll make you happy. And there's also other stuff that's non-musical because, you know, I have more than just this podcast. I'm a full-rounded individual. Um, so heartofmarkness.com. Go visit it. Leave some comments. I love hearing from you guys. I sound like a, a YouTuber. You know, hit like if you agree. If not, tell me why in the comments. Um, But yeah, I love hearing from you guys. Um, Every time I I post a podcast, I always get a couple of comments or a couple of emails from people that um, really touch my heart and make me happy. It's nice to connect with people that otherwise I would not connect with. And it's nice to share my uh, ridiculous 
obsession with the band Led Zeppelin with other people who who enjoy it and to share this music because you know where else are you going to hear a live performance of nobody fault nobody's fault but mine from led zeppelin's uh 1980 tour or hear them jamming with bad company unless you're a super fan who downloads tons of shows and collects bootlegs or you go on youtube yes or you listen to this podcast it makes me happy hopefully it makes you happy i make your drive to work better keep you from driving off the road off a bridge keep you from hitting your kids i don't know in any case thank you very much for listening i enjoy doing this and i'll be doing a lot more of it so yay so here we go the second to the last performance a whole lot of love you won't hear from me after this thank you very much heart of markness (laughs) bye-bye